Welcome to Book Backstory. My name is Carla Brandenburg, and I'm an award-winning author of romantic suspense and paranormal novels. This podcast is a walk along my journey. I plan to interview some of my favorite authors, share with you some of the things that get me excited to write a book, and the stumbling blocks during the process. This week, we're going to talk about developing characters. A common misconception, characters are people we know in disguise. Okay, that might be partially true, but as I've mentioned in other episodes, little pieces of people, not the whole enchilada. For instance, one day when I was walking on the platform at Union Station in Chicago, I passed a woman who smelled lovely. Yes, you heard that right. In a sooty, dirty, diesel-filled train station, her fragrance was bright and fresh. I'm going to guess it was something like coconutty limeish. I went home and assigned the fragrance to one of my characters. But Carla, I hear you saying, you didn't know that woman, so that doesn't count. My point is that these are the types of things I take away, whether I know the person or not. Little pieces of something that stand out and not the person as a whole. One particular attribute. When I start writing, I begin with the impetus. What motivated me to write the story? And then I draw my characters. How do they fit with what I want to show? Characters are generally the heart of the story, so the first step is developing their goals, their motivation, and their conflicts also known as GMC. I'll be honest here, because so often I write by the seat of my pants, I don't always develop GMC right away. But if I don't have it figured out within the first three chapters, I have to stop and make a plan. That being said, sometimes I need three chapters to get to know my characters. And sometimes it begins with the name. My hairstylist asked me once how I came up with names for my characters. Often they pop into my head out of the blue. After 20 plus books, I have to be careful not to reuse the same names over and over and over. And for that reason, I maintain a database, my book Bible. I add names to the database as they pop into my head, sometimes while watching sports or as the credits float by at the end of a TV show or even touring a cemetery. I've even taken names from street signs. As an example, in my Mist series, there's a bad guy in the second book named Tiago. I thought that name was so cool. I was watching World Cup soccer at the time, and with a name like that, he invited a little international travel. The names sometimes inspire their personalities, and sometimes the names have a deeper meaning. I had a character named Kira Ellison, which I chose because I like the name Kira. Anyone ever seen the movie Xanadu? But here's the subconscious piece to that. Kira has Greek origins based on Cyrus, the sun god. When combined with Ellison, it can be construed as Kiri Eleison, or Lord Have Mercy. The book was called Touched by the Sun, in which the hero believes Kira to be the sun his father always told him would visit him. Also in the book is a discovery of religious artifacts at Pompeii, a case of being more clever than I intended with my character's name. While the name might influence preconceived notions of who that person is and even the story they are part of, let's get back to the drawing board. A character begins with a character sketch. What does your character look like? I have one friend who does character interviews. Before they get started, they talk to their character and they ask them all kinds of questions and that's how they develop their character sketch. You need to start with a physical description. Some authors base their characters on models or famous people and keep that photo nearby for reference. I find that to be a good starting point sometimes, but my characters are their own people, and I always worry that basing them on someone famous will alter the personality I'm striving to have. Next, I move on to what makes them stand out in a crowd. In my new release, Enchanted Memories, you'll meet Madeline, who dresses in a manner my editor refers to as goth. She has tattoos and piercings and dresses in bralettes and short skirts and leggings coupled with boots or sandals with fringe. She also dyes her hair black and sometimes adds red extensions for color. She definitely stands out in a crowd, and that's part of her personality. She dresses that way for a reason. She's five foot five, and if trouble finds her, people will notice. But it's a double-edged sword. People also treat her differently because of the way she dresses, which means she's often disappointed by preconceived notions. The why she stands out is part of her backstory. What makes her the way she is? 
Readers don't want that thrown at them all at once. A little bit here, a little bit there. It is important for the author to know, though. Okay, now she needs an occupation. My witches are subtle in the Hill and Dale novels. People can guess at the things they don't know, but they never talk about it because they don't really want to know. And yet, Madeline doesn't appear to have a job, so her nosy neighbor calls her out. Madeline doesn't explain herself to anyone. That's part of her personality. But it comes to light that she does consulting with the police department. That's enough to add respectability in the neighbor's mind to whitewash the fact that Madeline can also do unusual things. Now we need to give her GMC. Madeline has an incident in her backstory, a consult gone bad that she's recovering from. But the powers that be are drawing her back out of her shell. With the arrival of spring, people are coming out of their houses again, and they want to know about their new small-town neighbor, including the policeman across the street who asked her to consult on a new case. Madeline's goal? Find the missing woman. Her motivation? Reclaim her life and use the gifts she was born with. Her conflict? She has history with the policeman across the street, including the fact she's enchanted his memory to keep him from remembering that one time when she was sure he was about to brush her off. In her mind, she'd rather he forget than deal with recriminations. More conflict? Getting back to work now means worrying about the incident that sidelined her might happen again. More conflict yet? Her sole support system, her brother, is moving halfway across the country. I've also given her an unconscious tick. She self-soothes by touching one of her tattoos. And speaking of ticks, I've developed whole characters based on their tick alone. For instance, in Touched by the Sun, the hero taps his fingers off in a sequence against his thumb when he's wound up. He bears the weight of responsibility in his family, and while he maintains a calm exterior, he gives himself away every time his fingers start ticking. Where do I come up with these things? At the time I was writing that book, I found myself performing that particular ritual while I was brainstorming. I don't think I've done it regularly since then. This is another thing an author, as a trained observer, steals from the people around them. Maybe from a friend or an acquaintance, but that doesn't turn the character into that person. It's borrowing one facet. Once I've created my main character, they need to have characters they can feed off of. For instance, in a romance, you want a hero that is in opposition while having more things in common than they realize. Going back to Enchanted Memories, Kyle was burned by a witch once before. No pun intended. So he's gun shy when the new witch shows up in town. The good news for Kyle is that he's been given his dream job of being a canine handler. Madeline is afraid of dogs. Opposition. Those people following my Hill and Dale series will know that Kyle has control issues. He needs to protect the people in his life, and that trait is developed more in this latest book than in any of the others. We find out how he got to that point, which becomes a breaking point in his last relationship. All characters need to have both positive and negative traits. Nobody likes perfect people. An interesting point when developing characters is finding a way to spin their negative traits into positive, which brings me to character art. In each book, characters need to grow. In the case of my Hillendale novels, Kyle has been a secondary character up until this most recent installment. We've seen his personality and his problems. It isn't until the fifth book that we see how he has grown as a person through the series. The prior books have been about Bryn and her development, her character arc. Let's look at her for a moment. Family alchemy begins with Bryn's goal of going to college. She gets hit with all kinds of obstacles along the way. Hey, that's the fun part about writing. Give them bad things to overcome. It starts with her getting dumped by her boyfriend and getting kicked out of the house almost immediately after her high school graduation. As she embarks on her journey, her goal becomes more attain unattainable. The story is in the journey, how she learns who she really is, what she really wants, while overcoming the roadblocks life throws in her way. The experiences shape who she becomes, her growth as a person. Each subsequent book in the series throws a new challenge her direction, one she has to rise above and learn from until her role changes in book four, Interrupted Magic, which opens the door for Madeline's appearance. Bryn's character arc is completed. She has grown from apprentice to teacher. So developing characters, 
Start with your senses. What do they look like? Do they make a distinctive sound? Most recently, a friend is writing about a man with an attractive chuckle that sort of resonates with me. What do they smell like? And is that indicative of their occupation or personal grooming habits? Touch, smooth skin or rough, or another tactile response like slippery or rock hard. Taste, this might relate to their favorite food or what they ate right before someone kisses them. Begin with what stands out about them and go from there. Once you have your character, give them something to do. Goals, show why it's important. Motivation, and provide stumbling blocks to overcome. Conflict, then work on the backstory. What makes your character tick? These are critical points for an author to know. Things you don't want the reader to know right away, but to show bit by bit as the story unfolds. Has the goal changed over the course of the story? Have the stumbling blocks provided the character with personal growth? These are the things that turn flat characters into real people, characters readers can relate to. Thanks for tuning in. Drop me a comment and let me know what you think.